Christadelphians again give you a very warm welcome to tonight's Bible address. In that reading we just had, we read that in verse 14, Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and from the child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. And the Christadelphians are people who believe the Bible, and they believe the whole Bible, and we look at the whole Bible as a matter of study because it's all the Word of God. And when we go on to verse 15 where it says that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, here's a, another translation of that from the ESV which perhaps makes it a little clearer for you. How from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make thee wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and that's a very significant translation. All scripture is breathed out by God. So what we have in this Bible, not just the New Testament, not just the Gospel records, all scripture, says the Apostle Paul, has come as an emanation from God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for training in righteousness. And we can be equipped if we take notice of all the scriptures. So tonight we're going to look at God creating this world with reason and with purpose. And there are two parts to our address tonight that we'll deal with. We're going to look mostly at, at the fact that God created the world in which we live because without that, without a conviction that God has made this world and that God is in control of this world, the reason he created it doesn't have much significance. But we will cover both. So the first thing is, did God create this world? Because as you would be aware, most people in the world today probably believe in some form of evolution. That this world just came to be just by pure random chance. So the first question is, can we really believe in God the Creator today? That God made this world by his power and he made it in six days. Well, where do we start when we're trying to establish a belief in something? You start with the facts. Now these facts are undeniable facts. The universe exists. We can go and we can send spaceships out to the stars, to the other planets, and we find a universe that is incredibly balanced, has order and it has laws. It's, our Earth is perfectly placed within that universe and over a hundred unique factors exist to make sure that life could exist on this planet. And we'll talk more about those in a moment. The Earth around us sustains an amazing array of very intricate and intelligent life. So there are incredible things that exist. And one of those incredible things are we humans ourselves. We have a highly developed mind with memory and reasoning power, thinking skills, a moral capacity that we can think and, and, and take on good things and principles in our lives. We are a very much the top of the creation on this world, being more intelligent and more able to make tools and, and equipment and to, to memory and to teach things than the animals can. And the other fact is we have this Bible in our hands. So we have an earth, we have a universe, we have ourselves and we have a Bible. Now those are undeniable facts. If we go back and we stand with the evolutionists and we say all of those things happen by pure chance then we have an incredible amount of faith that is required to believe that. So here are the alternatives we have to explain what we see in those undeniable facts. We can believe that God exists, that there is a power out there in the universe that we can't fully explain, but there's a God out there that has the power to make everything in an instant. He has miraculous powers which are beyond our comprehension. That takes faith. Or we can believe, like Darwinian evolution believes, which is atheism, no God, that everything we see came from nothing. Now that's a pretty big leap of faith, isn't it? Everything we see came from nothing, which, we, which went bang and now we has got all the, all the things around us. It has no design, it has no purpose, it just happens to be by pure random chance that we're sitting in this beautiful world, in this incredibly balanced universe, with brains to think these things through, but it all just happened by pure random chance. 
and that we've come up from the slime and we're now going up through mutations and natural selection to be higher and higher forms of evolution. Well, you certainly need faith for either option, but I know which one I find more logical. Now, there are some statements in the Bible that are very vital for us. It says, he that cometh to God must believe that he is. This is Hebrews 11 verse 6. So God says the first principle in coming to find me is you have to come to believe that I exist and that I have a reason. I will reward you if you seek after me. How does the Bible open? Well, it's the grandest opening of any book you'll ever open. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. A dramatic, powerful statement that says it all. And by faith, we understand, says Hebrews 11, that the universe or the ages of man were created by the word of God. And God didn't need to have something to work on. God can make all of those things out of things which did not exist. You see, God has that power to create things out of nothing. To believe that things can create themselves out of nothing takes a lot more faith. So, where do we turn to understand the world in which we live? Well, some people turn to the theory of evolution. It is a totally unproven an unscientific theory. How can I say it's unscientific? Well, science has two basic principles to establish a law or a fact of science. One, it has to be observed happening. And number two, you must be able to replicate that action that you can prove that a law exists. So take the law of gravity. You drop a brick off a building, it will go down. You drop it again, it will go down. You can observe it, you can replicate it. So you can say there is a law of gravity and you can then measure the speed of its fall and you can work out that that is a scientific law. But no one's observed evolution and no one can replicate it. So it's unscientific to say that it's an established fact. It is no more than a theory. It's an attempt to explain how this amazing universe and world happens to be here. With all its complexity and how it came up from nothing but perhaps some amino acids in a pool somewhere. So why are we faced with this theory? Well, people don't want to accept God. And evolutionists are united on one thing, even though they disagree on many, many details of their theory. They are united on one thing, they will not let God in the door. Evolution, if you believe it, has one big problem. It gives you no reason for being here. It gives you no future to go anywhere else, to be part of anything else. All you've got is your short life upon this earth and you are just part of an evolutionary process. You're just like a blade of grass that comes up and passes away. But why is evolution so popular? If it's got nothing to offer by way of reason, nothing to offer by way of hope or future, what's it, why is it so popular? Well, it's popular because people have been told they have to believe it. Now, most academic institutions, that is our universities, are funded by secular or human-based governments. If you want to get a job in those places or be a professor in those places, you have to support the generally accepted naturalist, which is no-God theories, of evolution. Otherwise, your funding or your employment is withdrawn. So they shut out all the people who believe in intelligent design. <coughs> And they do that because men do not want to face up to the possibility that there is a God, the creator. Because if there is, probably he has a reason for doing what he's done. The reason why so many people believe that evolution must be true is they are constantly told that these are facts when they're nothing more than theories. And so the theories obtain a greater status than they actually deserve. Professor Henry Morris said this, the main reason that most educated people believe in evolution is simply because they have been told that most educated people believe in evolution. So it feeds on itself. So what did Darwin bring to the world? What did Charles Darwin, who went off to try and formulate this theory, come up with? Well, he came up with the theory of evolution. It's a concept of spontaneous generation of life that life started as a single cell dividing. We now know how complicated even a single cell is. 
and all the protons and neutrons you need to make up that cell to work. Yet this cell came into being by itself and it divided. If it divided, it decided to go on dividing. And it became some sort of creature, a snail or a slug or something like that. And it ends up with all the animals and men we see today on the earth. <coughs> Spontaneous generation. Generating lots of new species and then cutting out those who didn't meet the didn't cut the ice, so there were natural selection, there was mutation, so it would mutate into something else and that would be propagated. And so new species came along. And you've seen the evolutionary tree. Survival of the fittest takes out those who are not fit to survive in that tree. And so what we have today is the fittest who have survived in all the different classes of nature. It all depends on incredibly unbelievable odds that this all came to pass by chance. Totally unbelievable odds. So evolution suggests that there is this upward form of life. You may not be aware that Charles Darwin, having propagated this theory as an interesting speculation, was amazed when the ideas took root. In his book, he said this, I was a young man and unformed with unformed ideas. I threw out queries, suggestions, wondering all the time over everything. And to my astonishment, the ideas took like wildfire. People made a religion of them because they wanted to get rid of God in their lives. So where did evolution fail? Well, it fails on a number of grounds. It got no explanation where the first matter came from. They would talk about a big bang, but what went bang? What made it go bang? What was there before the Big Bang to go bang? They got no answer for any of those questions. They can't go back to give you any origins. They can't tell you how life came to be upon the earth. They can speculate, but they cannot prove anything. They can't find any fossils between this species and that species. And yet there's supposed to be all these intermediary fossils between the species. Let me be clear about one thing. You can breed within a species. You can have a mastiff dog and a great dane right down to the little, little, little chihuahua. That's within the same species, but you'll never get a different species by breeding dogs. Mutations, where animals are born with deformities, do not continue to the next generation, nor do they improve a species. absolutely impossible mathematically to calculate the blind chance needed for just one creature to exist, <coughs> let alone hundreds and thousands of them. And the whole evolution story has been littered with frauds and extreme optimism. In Darwin's book, Origin of the Species, he uses the phrase maybe, could be, might be 800 times because he has no facts to back up his theory. And the dating methods are highly suspect because they depend upon a theory of uniformity over billions of years. So are we anti-science? Well, no, we're not against science. Science has done some many good things for the world, particularly in the field of medicine. Science more and more enables us to comprehend the absolute brilliance of the mind and the wisdom of the Creator, because now we have microscopes and macroscopes, and we can go down and look at things that people could never see in days gone past. But science can give you nothing about why it's here. It can give you nothing about where it's all going. And it's got no idea when it comes to the subject of God, other than to deny him. And you ask a scientist about the virgin birth, the resurrection of the dead, Fulfilling Bible prophecy, angels, immortality, they have got nothing to say because they have no facts. So science has its place, but it cannot tell us about the things that really matter in relation to our existence on this world. And the Bible warns us to be very careful about following human wisdom. Paul wrote to Timothy, O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. And our world claims that they have got knowledge. 
They have all these speculations that they make. For by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. And we've got to make sure we don't lose our faith in God by listening to all the high-sounding learning of this world. And there are some people who say, well, I believe that God was involved in the process, that God used evolution. And they are called theistic evolutionists. So they get rid of the chance and they put God in there and say, well, God used a long-term evolutionary process over perhaps four to six billion years. So it's an attempted compromise with the evolutionists. Charles Darwin knew about those sort of people and he said this about them. I would give absolutely nothing, said Charles Darwin, for a theory of natural selection if it required miraculous intervention at any one stage of descent. So he would have nothing to do with the theistic evolutionists. How odd that many of those try and compromise with him, but he wanted nothing to do with them. And the Bible warns us that if people are determined to get rid of God, if people are determined not to listen to any facts about God, to have any faith in God, then God will make it harder for them. And the Bible tells us God will delude those who will not believe the obvious. Romans 1 verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a mind void of judgment. You put God out of your mind, you deny the obvious about God, God says, I'll make it harder for you. He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. God will send a strong delusion to those who will not believe the obvious truth. So God will delude those who are determined to get rid of him. You know, these comments about science are from scientists themselves. Science works best when dealing with things that are testable and repeatable. But it's no good at telling us what happened in the past because you can't test it and you can't repeat it. That's why science is repeatedly changing its views and its theories. By contrast, the Bible is a reliable historian. It's reliable when dealing with Earth's history. In fact, now they say the Bible is one of the most reliable history books that there ever has been because it was inspired by somebody who was there. It's an eyewitness account. There was observation of these events, and so God has recorded them for us. God makes a challenge. In the book of Job, God challenges mankind to own up and to say, what have you seen? And he made this challenge. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. And God makes that challenge to our scientists today. The world exists, you exist, beautiful things exist. What does science say? They have a theory that these things just happen to come to pass for no reason and with nothing to start from. And God says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Who determined the measurements of the earth? Who stretched a line upon it? Who set out the heavens? Who made sure the earth was in the right place? Well, God says, I was there. So we're up against a scientific community that tries to tell us that we have to agree with them because they can't accept the alternative that there might be a God. The theory of academia today is we teach you how to think critically and examine the evidence, except for evolution. We will tell you what to think about it and we won't accept any embarrassing questions. So the evolutionists in the, in the academic community are very keen that we should not ask these hard questions. So let's just skip ahead a bit. I want to give you evidence now to believe in a wise creator. There are many, many reasons for us to believe that there is a creator God out there. Let me just look at some of, some of them. The absolute perfection of conditions for the universe and for the earth that life might be supported here. The magnificent intricate creation with all the inbuilt instincts of different animals all indicate to us creative intelligence. Complementary things, insects, plants, animals that work together for their own survival. The abilities to migrate and to know where they're going, whether it be butterflies or birds or animals. 
And then we come down to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Was he a historical figure? The way he transformed the men who followed him and the fact that he rose from the dead. So there are many reasons for us, circumstantial reasons, to believe in a God that exists. And here's what God says about himself. I created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth and made it. I didn't create it in vain, says God, I made it to be inhabited. In Exodus 31 verse 17, in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth. And the Lord Jesus Christ agrees with that. He says, in the beginning of the creation which God created, So both Old and New Testament agree that God created this world. And notice there in Isaiah 45 verse 18, the reason he created it. I created it to be inhabited, said God. So this world is hanging there in space because God wants it to be a place that people will live on. And we'll talk more about that towards the end of our address. Now let's go back and think about the absolutely unique planet that we live on. They have discovered, so they say, at least 122 critical factors that make life on this planet a possibility. If any one of them were altered by 0.1%, that is in the magnetic force, in the relationship of the Earth and the Moon, the relationship to other planets, the size of the Earth, if any one of them altered by about 0.1%, life would no longer be possible on this planet. So what an amazing coincidence that this planet exists in the universe with all these factors to make it possible for life. Here are some of those factors. The Earth is exactly the right distance from the Sun. We go in closer, we'd, we would burn. We go out further, we would freeze. We have an ozone layer. You know what men did to the ozone layer with their CFCs? We started to put holes in it. You used to go to South Island, New Zealand to get yourself horribly sunburnt on very, very cool days because the ozone layer had been thinned out. And it's a very, very thin layer. But it's just the right distance above the earth to filter out the harmful rays from the sun. Without it, we could not live. If the earth were 10% larger or smaller, life could not exist. Our planet has oxygen and water on it, never found on any other planet. The moon is in exactly the right position with exactly the right magnetic forces to revolve around the earth and to cause our tidal patterns which are so useful to the regeneration of the seas. We have an earth tilted off its axis so that we have seasons. The earth has a very precise magnetic field. The rotation of the earth matches human sleep patterns. The relative size of the sun and the earth is critically important. The balance on the earth of the stable elements of carbon, hydrogen and oxygen. God says of all these things, I formed it to be inhabited. Look at, this is a, the world famous biologist Lawrence Henderson. There is in truth, he says, not one chance in countless millions of millions that the many unique properties of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and especially their stable compounds, water and carbonic acid, which chiefly make up our atmosphere, so the Earth's atmosphere, there's not one chance in millions and millions and millions, he said, that you could have that simultaneously in the three elements together. There must be a law that connects them. There are, these are no mere accidents. So the men who do know and who have analysed what we see around us, say, look, this is impossible that this could come by chance. It shrieks design. Stephen Hawking you might have heard of. The odds against the universe like ours emerging out of something like the Big Bang are enormous. I think clearly that there are religious implications whenever you start to discuss the origins of the universe. There must be religious overtones. But I think that most scientists prefer to shy away from those religious implications. So how did life come? Well, Darwinian evolution will never explain how life came. This generation spontaneous in some mineral soup sounds good until you look at the evidence. And today we have 
DNA. Now, DNA is the fantastic coding that's in our bodies, which has only been discovered in the last 50 years and only properly understood in the last 10 years. They are still finding out how remarkable DNA is. And when the world's leading skeptic and atheist, Richard Dawkins, was pressed on BBC television to explain where DNA came from, he had to say it could not come by chance. So where did it come from? Well, he said perhaps some space travellers planted the seeds of life and DNA upon the earth. And that's where the world's leading skeptic and atheist has to admit it is far, far too complex for anyone to suggest it came by chance, not even the most optimistic evolutionist. So, let's take up God's challenge. You imagine finding on a beach somewhere a mobile phone or an iPad just lying on the beach and you're walking along there. If you knew nothing what it was, could you start it up and it would work? Would you believe that it just happened to come together by the sand and the water that were there on the beach and the chemicals lying around that it actually just formed itself into a mobile phone. Not even the most optimistic person could believe that could happen by chance. And yet the creation is far more complex and intelligent than a mobile phone can be. And so it indicates at every step divine, divine purpose. Now I'm going to just show you a few things from creation just to hopefully cement in your minds that these things are far too fantastic for things that happen by chance. God said 3,000 years ago to a man called Job in the Bible, hast thou entered the treasures of the snow or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail? Until recent times, perhaps the last couple of hundred years, we didn't know what God was referring to when he made that challenge. But God knew what he was talking about. Because when you put snowflakes under a microscope, you get something like this. Or this. Or that. Or this. Or that. So God said there are treasures in the snow. All of them based upon six-sided figures, and they've never found two that are the same. Do you believe that just happened by chance? That there's such incredible design and patterns in those things. And God knew about it 3,000 years ago, before man had microscopes. And God challenges us. Who put wisdom in the inward parts of created things? Look at the instincts of creatures, maternal instinct, camouflage, migratory knowledge, homing instincts, amazing senses of smell, hearing and sight, the foreknowledge of weather, radio location for bats. All of these things that man has tried to imitate when he's tried to make his own devices, not always very successfully. But God says, where did that wisdom come from in creation? Ask the beasts, he said, and they will teach you. The birds of the heaven, and they will tell you. Who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord hath done this? Any person observing nature would have to say that there is intelligent design. Have a look at this little guy. The amazing hummingbird. Now I often say to people at this juncture of the lecture, Put your finger up and try and waggle it 20 times in 10 seconds and you won't better do it. This little character beats his wings at 70 times a second. That is, they go from up there, down here, back up again, 70 times a second. He can fly in either, any direction forwards, backwards, up, down, or hover exactly still in one spot while he's feeding. He carries pollen on his head to other blossoms, which wouldn't grow if he wasn't there. How did they grow before he evolved? He takes mites between different plants also for the process of germination. How can that evolve? You think of 70 times a second the structure you need in those muscles 
nerve systems, bones and wings and feathers to move that fast. And that is the slowest hummingbird. The human body. The Bible says this, you formed my inward parts, you knitted me together in my mother's womb. Anyone who's had a child or a grandchild knows what a remarkable miracle it is that a baby comes into the world with fingers and toes and all the things that it needs for life. Fearfully and wonderfully made, says the Bible. Well, DNA, as we said in the last 50 years, a huge unlocking of the life code that controls our bodies and our mechanisms in our bodies. Could this complicated structure just happen? That's what it looks like. DNA is so, so small that all of your DNA could be put in half of a teaspoon. But it's the code of life in your body, an incredible chain of atoms and cells that regulate with their interaction and the messages they send through each other to make sure your body operates like it should. And the Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And in the Hebrew it means woven together. And here is this thing which looks like a, a knitting pattern of a scarf. But it's all the different atoms that make up the code that regulates your body. If you like, it's the program of your body. What an amazing thing DNA is. This is Professor Andy McIntosh. The logical coded machinery of DNA and the information system it carries shout design to an unprejudiced mind. Evolutionary thinking is teetering as a way of looking at the evidence not because of some isolated problems here and there, but because the whole structure evolution is scientifically wrong. Now this is what the, the, the great scientists are starting to say, particularly because of DNA. So Anthony Flew was the a renowned atheist, top of his community in the scientific world. After the ENCODE project that finished in 2012 where they examined the use of DNA, he said this, it now seems to me that the findings of more than 50 years of DNA research have provided materials for a new and enormously powerful argument for design. Investigation of DNA has shown by the unbelievable complexity of the arrangements which are needed to produce life that intelligence must have been involved. As a scientist I have to go where the evidence leads. Now there's one of the world's leading atheists that's come over in the last five years. He can no longer believe in chance for DNA. I'll give you a simple example you'd be aware of every day. Just to show you how remarkable our body is. You cut your finger, you expose your blood to the atmosphere. Immediately what the body says, and the DNA code has, call out a thing called promothobin, PTA. Promothobin says, right, okay, I've got a job to do, I've got to go and, re and release this guy called thrombin. So it, it actually has a, a cautionary process. It's like going to the, the teller machine. You put in your PIN number. It's to prevent accidents happening. So there's got to be an extra code going. So that then says, OK, I've got the message. This is a, a necessity. I now need to go and find this fibri, fibronogen. So it goes around the body and it collects all this, this, this stuff which is a bit like um, little bits of wood and little splinters and it brings it all to the spot of the womb. So you've all got to come to this particular spot in the blood circulation and block up the gap so that the blood can't escape. You cut your finger within a couple of minutes it will stop bleeding. Why? You ever wondered why? Well because two separate processes have taken place to get into that wound sufficient stuff to gunk it up and block it. We talk about blood congealing, but what it really means is that you've actually had that blocked. So that's a remarkable process, isn't it? Now think about that. Could that process evolve? Notice the multi-stage unlocking process to prevent accidents. The three-stage process ensures that fibrin blood clots do not form inside the body. You think about it. If every time there was an internal bleeding in your body, it clotted up, would it be what you want? Well, you don't want blood clots inside your body. You want your blood to flow. You don't want it clotting up in your veins or in your brain. 
What would have happened to the first evolving creature to bleed? Oh dear, I think I missed something. I need this thing to stop myself bleeding to death. Those of you who are mechanically minded know that when you've got a car that's got a leaking radiator or a leaking part in the motor, you can stick in all the gunk you like. All you do is to gunk up the whole motor. Man can't find a way to stop just the part where the leak is. And yet God created the perfect clotting mechanism to stop us bleeding to death. So there's just a little example from how beautifully and wonderfully made we are. Let's just take one more before we move on to the second part of our address. Eyes. And there's a good reason why I'm doing this, because Dar Charles Darwin had something to say about the human eye. Now, you know the eye, it's made up of lots of different parts. The Bible says, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made both of them. Look at the different parts we've got there in our eye. It's basically a big lump of jelly with a, a lens on the front. Light comes in upside down, the brain turns it around. It talks to the brain. And if I know that that's a microphone, my eye's telling me it's there. My brain can see it instantly and I can reach out and touch it. So look at all that happening so quickly. This just shows you the complexity of the eye. We won't go into all the detail, but it's a remarkable structure. Just some facts about the eyes. When you're conceived, a million optic nerves start to grow from both the eye and the brain. So as the cells are dividing, there's an eye cell and there's a brain cell. And they start to send out a million optic nerves. It's like a great big Telstra cable. And they have to find their counterpart as they grow towards each other and link up correctly, otherwise you won't see anything. What a remarkable process that is to happen by chance. Number one, that they grow towards each other, and secondly, they find each other. And when your eye is formed, it can adjust at phenomenal speed to light variations, spherical and chromatic aberrations, distance and movement. Our eyes are remarkable things. A few facts, few more facts about the eyes. They have eight, two million working parts. Eight million cone cells of de that detect colour. 20 million rod cells that detect contrasts. Which is why you can distinguish 500 shades of grey. You can actually detect the difference in 500 different shades of grey. Your eyes blink 4.2 million times a year. So fast you don't even know what's happening to you. Eyes don't need rest. They're always totally 100% ready for action. The eye muscle is the strongest in the body. A hundred times more than it needs to be. The lens can change shape for different distances. And your pupils dilate to let the light intensity come in or out. It is the most remarkable machine. And that's just the human eye. You go down to the insects, some of them have got hundreds of eyes all working together. That's what Charles Darwin said about the human eye. To suppose that the eye, with all its inimitable contrivances for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light and the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration, could have been formed by natural selection seems, I confess, absurd in the highest degree. I'll bet your evolutionary professor or teacher at school never quoted you Darwin, Charles Darwin on that one. You see, he said it was absurd in the highest degree to believe that could happen by chance. And yet they say it all happened by pure accident. So it takes more faith to believe in spontaneous evolution than to believe in a creator. So why did God create this beautiful world? Well, let's look at now the reason why God created the world in which we live. God has a purpose with our earth. In Numbers 14, 21, God says, As truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. It was when God began in the Garden of Eden. Man brought sin into the world. A process of redemption has been underway and is about to come to its culmination. And God will again fill the earth with his glory. The earth should be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So something's going to happen to bring this process that God started to its appointed end. 
and that will be our divine government. And we're standing on the brink of the day when God has said he will take control of this world once again. In the days of these kings, had we time, we could show you that we are living in the days of the kings referred to here. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. There's going to be one worldwide government on the earth with God as its head, God as its lawmaker, and ruled over by the Lord Jesus Christ. It will not be voted out of office. It shall break in pieces and consume all the current governments of the world, and it shall stand forever. So God has a very deliberate purpose. His son Jesus Christ is going to return. When he was born, his mother was told that her son would be called Jesus. He shall be great, shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And the birth of Jesus started the process of God's kingdom coming to be. He will come back to the earth, not this time as a saviour to die. He will come back as a king to reign. God has appointed a day, says Paul in Acts 17, 31, in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he raised from the dead. In Acts 1, verse 11, the angels told the apostles, this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. In the New Testament alone, there are 200 references or more to the second coming of Christ. We're waiting for the day when God will establish his kingdom on the earth and there will be a divine takeover from the governments of this world. Therefore wait upon me, says the Lord, until the day that I rise up to the prey. For my determination is to gather the nations, that I may assemble the kingdoms to pour upon them mine indignation. Why is God angry? Look what men have done to his will. Look how they've polluted and corrupted his creation. Look how they have corrupted the people of the world. Look at the crime, the terrorism, the autocrats, the dictators, the oppressors, the inequity of the earth. God says, I've had enough. I'm going to change things. I will then turn to the people a pure language that they may serve me with one consent. There's going to be one worldwide religion. God intends to take control of this world through his son. Out of it will come a new world order. The Apostle Peter, in Acts chapter 3, said, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restoration or restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all the holy prophets since the world began. And we would love to have the time with you to go down and sit down with those prophets and to show you all the predictions that God makes about this kingdom that is to come on the earth. But here we are in the New Testament. Here we are after the death and resurrection of Christ, being told to go back to the prophets to work out what is coming in the future. Let me summarise what the Bible says is yet ahead for us. The Bible says that in the next few years there will begin a time of trouble across the world, unprecedented in its severity. You thought the Second World War was bad, worse is coming. In the middle of that the return of Christ will take place and he will raise those who have followed him. If you've got Timothy open it says in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 1, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. So Christ is coming back to raise those who have followed him. And then there will be the battle of Armageddon and a worldwide war will take place. God will defeat all the nations through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. There will be one worldwide government based in Jerusalem and the law of God will extend to all nations. 
And that will lead to a time of peace and prosperity for the world and a thousand year reign of the Lord Jesus Christ, which we know as the millennium. That's what the Bible predicts for the future. That is the reason and the purpose that God started in this world 6,000 years ago and it's about to come to its final product. So we put before you a faith that makes sense. Just look at the world around you. Just look at the beauty of what God created. Look at your own body and how marvellous and wonderful it is. And believe there is one God, the Creator. That he's in control of this world. That he will soon change this world for the better. And understand that God wants you to be part of that future. God has made very great promises that we must believe. So you have a choice to make. You can say, I'm going to put my faith in the scientists. Surely they are intelligent men who know what they're talking about. But the more questions you ask, the more you seek for facts and not theories, you will be disappointed. And the Bible says it's better to trust in the Lord than to put your confidence in man. And we are given promises that we can actually fix our hopes on. 2 Peter 1 verse 4 says this, There are given unto us great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. We can share the eternity of God and escape the corruption that's in the world through the lusts of men. So that's the simple offer that God makes. Have faith, and it is a leap of faith, have faith that God exists from all the circumstantial evidence you see around you. The other choice is to say, I want to believe in total, irrational, unreasonable, blind chance. That's the simple choice we're faced with. Whatever choice we make will not stop the return of Christ to the earth. Jesus warned this just before he was put to death 2,000 years ago. Take heed to yourselves. Just at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting, which is self-indulgence and drunkenness and the cares of this life, and that day come upon you unawares. The majority of mankind, particularly in the Western world, is just involved in pleasure-seeking, and they will be caught unawares. The warning to us is, watch you therefore and pray always, you might be accounted worthy to escape all these things that are going to come to pass, and to stand, that is to stand accepted, before the Lord Jesus Christ. We saw that in Timothy. So where do we go from here? Well, we encourage you to search the scriptures for yourself, to find out whether these things be so. To stand back and consider the great works of God. Just go home tonight and think about those snowflakes, that hummingbird. The human eye. And ask yourself the simple question, could that just have happened for no reason, from nothing, for no purpose? And if you can't answer those three questions honestly, then you've got to find out why it happened and where it's going and what God is going to do with your world. So God created. And he created with a reason and a purpose and a plan, and that plan is well underway and it's about to come to its final stage. You can be involved. You need not just have your life and die and be gone forever. You can be involved in God's eternal future. And we encourage you to let us help you with that as we turn our faith to the Bible. Thank you.